Hi, I'm Ray with another podcast episode. Now, this time, have a think about this. Say it's 1930s, 1920s even, 1930s. You don't have a telephone in your house. You don't have a TV, of course, and you don't have a radio. So what do you do for entertainment? Well, entertainment is the cinema. So if the family want to go and see a film, they go down to the local cinema and that was it. There's nothing at home or a piano. A lot of of people had pianos, didn't they, if they could afford them. So what did they do about news? Well, there was Pathé news at the cinema. So that was probably another reason to to go and see the latest film, because you also see Pathé news to catch up on what was going on around the world. The only other place to get news from was the newspaper, hence the name, newspaper. So that was it. So if something happened, say, in Indonesia, Australia, South America... How did the news get to you in your home? Well, before radio, there was telegraph, wasn't there, over wires. So the telegraph system, something would happen in, I don't know, in, say, uh, Rio de Janeiro. Someone would telegraph with the Morse code over the wires, you know, the old telegraph poles, to wherever. That would eventually perhaps reach California. Uh, Perhaps it would get to Chicago, Washington, and eventually to a ship at New York that would perhaps bring the news over to Southampton, where it would then be telegraphed to newspaper offices. I mean, all this takes weeks. (laughs) Imagine, it takes weeks. I don't know how the system operated then, but they did then have uh, marine cables, didn't they? Undersea cables. So they could send telegraph messages direct from, say, Washington to London or whatever. Even then... The news has got to get from Rio de Janeiro up to Washington and then be sent across and then get to the newspaper offices. So it all took a long time and then end end up in your newspaper or Pathé News. I mean, Pathé News, they used to have uh, reels of film, didn't they, from around the world. Well, they had to, they couldn't send the film electronically. The, The reel of film from wherever, say something happened in Australia, That had to go by ship, possibly some of it by plane, I don't know, but by ship. Now, how many weeks would it have taken for a ship to get from Australia to the UK? These days, you look at news as it's happening. Say something, there's a sinkhole, okay, in uh, Los Angeles. A big sinkhole appears in the middle of the highway. Someone's there videoing it on their phone. Within minutes, that's on Twitter. Within minutes again... I'm watching it on my mobile phone or live because these days you can do live videos, can't you? So I can actually watch the sinkhole happening in California, in Los Angeles, live on my phone. If you'd said that to someone back in those days, they would have said, well, you're joking. How could that possibly be? You know, live pictures. How could that possibly be? So let's go back now to the 30s. How did people get their news? When radios first came along, imagine what that must have been like. You go to the shop, the man of the house, as he was called then, probably can't say that now, it's uh, not politically correct, but the man of the house would go to the shop, the radio shop, and he would be shown various makes and models. You know, what do you want? Do you want shortwave? Uh, do you want to listen to stations from around the world or just long and medium wave? And he'd eventually choose a radio. The shop would then deliver it because it had to be installed. Well, these days you buy a radio, well, you buy one online, it's delivered. You unpack it, put the batteries in, or they're probably already in if they're rechargeable types, and you use the radio. The chap would bring it round, the wireless engineer would come round in his little van, and he would install the radio for you. Also, he would install an aerial. He'd be up a ladder outside your house, screwing little insulators on eyelets, perhaps under your gutter, what is it, the soffit? the soffit board isn't it or something not the fascia and he'd screw them all around the outside run a wire through bring that down the wall drill a hole through your window frame into the lounge if that's where the radio was plug that in you might also if it had shortwave on you might need an earth for shortwave reception to be worthwhile so he'd run another lead out bang a stake into your garden or a metal stake the radio would be installed then he would show you how to use it he turn it on, you'd have to wait one, maybe two minutes or more for the valves to warm up. And of course, it, it must have been 
a fantastic experience as suddenly noises emanated from the speaker, crackling and whistling. It, it must have been a fantastic experience when you then hear some music. What's that? Oh, that's a, a concert live from the Albert Hall in London. To us these days, that sounds like nothing. That's not exciting. That's not anything to write home about. But then to have a live concert from the Royal Albert Hall in London actually coming out of a speaker in your lounge live as it's happening, it, it must have been incredible. And of course, tuning into the BBC Home Service. You know, here is the news. And of course, that's when the news was spoken in the Queen's English. That was rather nice. I do remember that in the early days of my life, hearing the news read properly. Not all this, oh, yeah, well, we're outside uh, Downing Street now. In it. Hang on a minute. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, there's no, he's not coming out yet. That's not, he's, he's just speak properly. Almost, I say, oh, no, we're outside Downing Street, uh, don't you know what? What? It wasn't quite that bad. But it was the Queen's English, which was nice. And of course, back then, the newsreader read the news. He read the news. He didn't, as they do these days, bung in their two pennyworth, you know, their, their opinions, or I think this, I think that. These days, it's, <laughs> they don't read the news. They say what they think, which no one's really interested in because they're all biased anyway. Anyway, that's another issue. That's another subject. We'll do that one another time. So imagine that, you're sitting in your lounge, you're listening to this radio, and you're getting news from around the world. I mean, even then, you know, don't forget that even then, the news had to get from around the world. But of course, with the advent of wireless radio, signals could be sent by Morse code and, and voice, of course. So if something happened in Australia, that would immediately be sent to, I don't know, wherever, across to... Uh, Indonesia or across to South America and it would be radio transmissions and of course as radio in the early days developed young Marconi he first sent his signal from the UK across to uh, was it Newfoundland wasn't it he started something he even he probably couldn't think I didn't realize how big it would how it would change the world which it did the internet's changed the world isn't it I don't think people realise that initially. So from sitting in your home with only a piano and a newspaper, that's your entertainment and your news, you've suddenly got this radio and you can tune around shortwave. If you had a shortwave radio with the aerial outside, you could listen to stations from around the world tuning in. What's this? Oh, oh, look, I've, I've, I've got Israel. Uh, I've got uh, a station here from Germany. I've got a station from you know, wherever. America, Australia, if you've got a good enough radio and a decent aerial and conditions were right, you could actually hear a radio station in Australia. So it must have been a fantastic experience. I mean, I remember when we got our first television, I was only, what, sort of five years old, four or five years old, I believe. My mother said the other day, the first ever TV programme I watched was The Wooden Tops. And, you know, I've, I didn't realise that, but I've always liked the wooden tops. In fact, this is before she said that the other day. I was watching the wooden tops on YouTube. <laughs> I know, I know, I'm, I'm a little bit old for the wooden tops now. But it was fantastic to watch that. You know, this is Jenny and Mrs Scrubbit and the biggest spotty dog you ever did see. <laughs> Sorry, I got carried away there. Before the television... It was Listen With Mother on the BBC Home Service, I believe, at 2 o'clock, 2 p.m. And then, of course, it was Watch With Mother. And I remember it all vividly, Watch With Mother. So, happy days. I mean, that, for me, wasn't a sort of life-changing experience because I was only sort of five years old. But for someone in their, I don't know, 40s, 50s, or any age, any adult, to suddenly have pictures in your lounge albeit on a very small screen, black and white, blurry, grainy pictures. <laughs> I remember when my grandparents first got a television, we were watching something, I don't know what it was, and we all went round to their house, and my grandfather drew the curtains, it was, it was in the evening, drew the curtains, lights off, and we all had to sit there in the dark and watch this little black and white screen in the corner of the room. I don't know why we had to sit in the dark. 
I think that was just him being mental, but because <laughs> he was a little bit touched in the head. But there we are. I just remember that, having to sit there in the dark. And of course, I was a very young age. I didn't want to sit there in the dark looking at this grainy black and white picture in the corner of the room. I wanted to do other things. You're probably going to find this difficult to believe, but the first radios, two-way radios in police cars, going back, was it the 30s, I believe? I can't remember. I've got an old book about it somewhere. They were Morse code. Can you believe that? In the police cars, they had a Morse key and a, a, a radio. I believe they worked, uh, for those that know about it, they worked on around 2 megs, 2, what, 2.1, 2100 kilohertz. Uh, so that was shortwave, just inside the shortwave band near medium wave, and it was Morse code. And there was some advantage to it because it did afford them some sort of privacy because not everyone in the street knew Morse code. You know, very few people could read Morse code. So they were afforded some privacy in their messages. But can you imagine that? The police car, you know, belting down the road, and presumably not the driver, but the passenger with a Morse key, da -da 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 sending Morse code back to HQ, and then they send Morse code to him. I mean, that's quite incredible. Sorry about that dinging. I don't know what it is. So many things these days they bleep and they ding do you know there are bleeps and dings that go off in our house and i don't know what they are we, we look around what was that it's something new we've never heard that before it wasn't your phone it wasn't mine either what was it probably some secret circuitry installed in a, a hi-fi tuner or in some electronic equipment we've just bought there's probably someone listening to us or watching on a little camera i remember my grandmother saying about the television that it was some sort of magical thing and she couldn't understand how you could get live pictures well not live necessarily but pictures on the tv you know from a london studio how how could people get so small as to fit in there people must have thought it was some sort of magical smoke and mirrors or something i remember as a radio and tv apprentice engineer in my early teens well mid-teens i suppose 15 16 i remember someone saying one day the TVs will be flat screen. And I, I thought, well, how can that possibly be? Because you've got the big cathode ray tube, you know, the huge glass CRT. How could you make that flat? It wouldn't work. There was no way you could make it flat. And I suppose thinking back, that was the wrong way to think about it. Think outside the box. That's a dreadful expression. Is that right? Am I using it in the right context? Think outside the box, meaning... Forget the old cathode ray tube, that huge, heavy, forget trying to make that smaller and flat or whatever, and some other system completely, which is, of course, what flat screen tellies are these days. They're not flat cathode ray tubes at all, far from it. So back in the early days of wireless and television, think outside the box. Don't think, how do you squeeze people into the, into the TV? They're not squeezed in there, are they? Think outside the box. I don't know what they must have thought. I do remember my grandmother standing, I had an electric train set, and she was standing on the wire from this little control box, the transformer. And I said, oh, the train isn't going. I don't know what's happened. She said, oh, is it because I'm standing on the wire? I'm stopping the electricity. People just had no understanding whatsoever back in those days. I do remember thinking when we had colour TV, stereo radio, uh, little cassette players, you know, the Walkman and all that. I remember thinking, what else could come along that would change the world as radio did and then TV? What else? There was nothing else. I remember thinking, what else could there be? We've got everything. What, what else could there be? And of course, the internet came along and look how that's changed the world. It really, I don't know whether it's changed it for the better or for the worst, really. But uh, so what's next? It's no good thinking now, Oh, well, we've done everything now. We've got the internet. We've got everything. What else could there be? I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. I collect old radio books from the 30s, 40s, uh, 50s. And it is incredible. The knowledge they had then about aerials. You know, I'm a radio amateur, so I'm always putting up aerials and looking into aerials, understanding how they work for theory. And way back then, in those pioneering days, their knowledge was fantastic. They really did understand what was going on. The theory uh, of aerials, for example, hasn't changed. You know, they were right. They got it right in those days. 
it's not different now. They weren't wrong. It's exactly the same. I can read uh, a book about aerials from the 1930s and it's exactly the same as a book written today about aerials. So they were very knowledgeable. I won't go into the, the sort of technical theory of radios, but going back then, they started off, of course, with a crystal set and you would listen with headphones. And if you just so much as breathed on the radio, it, it went off tune. So you'd spend ages tuning into 2LO, which was London. Someone would close the door, a bit of a draft or whatever, and you'd lose the station. And then you'd have a pair of headphones each, then a loudspeaker. And of course, then valves came along and it progressed. And then everyone could just sit in the room and listen to the radio. And all this is relatively short time ago, isn't it? Uh, where are we? 2020, go back to 1920. No one had a telephone, well, very few people had a telephone. Very few people had a radio. There was no television. So, you know, less than a hundred years, when you think how long the, you know, we've been here, uh, you know, thousands of years, it's all very, very recent, all this. I suppose as soon as electricity was discovered. Oh, there are the seagulls. That's it, my trademark. I wonder where they've got to. So thinking about it, it is very, very recent, all these developments with the advent of electricity, of course. I remember when we first got a telephone. I don't know how old I was, but I got home from school. It was primary school, so I couldn't have been that old, probably seven or eight. And I didn't know about this telephone in the hall. And my mother had arranged for a friend of mine down the road, they had a phone, to phone me at four o'clock. And I was in the kitchen and the phone rang I remember saying, what's that? She said, oh, it's a telephone. It must be a call for you. I went into the hall. You know, Hello. <laughs> and this chap said, hi, it's Alan down the road. I was actually speaking to my friend down the road on the phone. That was incredible. Because in those days, you gave the number. You didn't just say hello, like they do now. What was our, our first number? I'm trying to think. I remember 42295. That was it. 42295. And then 502928 when we moved. There we are. I can remember those numbers. Of course, some of the early phones, I remember seeing uh, on shop facias, you know, where it would say Smith's Greengrocer or something, that it would say, tell for telephone, 83. Okay, they didn't have all these numbers like they do now. Telephone 83. I mean, it would have started off someone's phone number it would have been four. It was your phone number, four. <laughs> That's easy to remember, isn't it? Four. Presumably someone's number would have been one. What's your phone number? One. Happy days. There we are. Have I bored you long enough? Where are we? 18 minutes into the podcast episode. Yeah, I hope you found it interesting. I love looking back. As I say, I've got all these old radio books. I love looking back at the at the technology then, the photographs, factories, you know, the Marconi factory, Bush Radio, Echo. Echo was um, E... K-C-O. The name came from Eric Cole, E.K. Cole, uh, and he just put it together to make Echo. As I say, I love looking back at the old books, not only about radio, but I've got other sort of do-it-yourself books, you know, build a wardrobe. And it's so funny to look back. You use fish glue and things like that to stick wood together. Fish glue. Oh, I don't know whether they actually went out and caught the fish to make glue. Anyway, waffling now. Hope you've enjoyed it. Thanks for listening as always and I shall see you next Sunday or you will hear me next Sunday hopefully for the next episode. Thanks again. Bye bye for now.